is our international panel. Um, everyone knows Mary Hesdorfer, the medical liaison for the Mesothelioma Foundation. Um, as you know, Mary is a fully credentialed nurse practitioner. She spent 15 years actively treating patients with mesothelioma. Um, she was at Columbia University and she's been with this organization for four years now. Um, Mary is the moderator of the panel and I'm going to just quickly introduce the panel members. Again, full bios are in your binders. Professor Stephen Munsayer is a senior research scientist and research group leader at the Lung Institute of Western Australia and Center for Asthma, Allergy, and Respiratory Research, School of Medicine and Pharmacology, University of Western Australia. Okay, um, Luciano Rudy. Currently, Dr. Rudy is Chief of the Department of General Medicine and Director of the Lab of Clinical Oncology in Vercelli Hospital, Italy. He's also filling the position of Interim of Consultant in Oncology at the Royal Marcel Marsden in London. Liz Darlson is responsible for the establishment of Mesothelioma UK, the National Macmillan Mesothelioma Research Center. Liz is currently a consultant nurse and clinical lead for Mesothelioma UK, which has established itself as an essential part of the UK Mesothelioma landscape. Eudis Goldberg. Dr. Goldberg is a program director for the Division of Adolescent Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. Toronto, Canada. She is a director and with her son, co-founder of the Canadian Mesothelioma Foundation. The foundation provides support and education to patients, families, and others in Canada affected by mesothelioma. Contrary is over to, to your facilitator, Mary. Again, I'd like to really thank all the panelists for being willing to participate in traveling such great distances to be here with us. Um, the purpose of this panel really is to give everyone sort of an idea of the flavor of what's happening with us in the various countries. Uh, as we all know, this is a global problem and it's going to take a global effort to find a cure for the disease. And we all have established uh, strong collaborations and we're really trying to further the relationship. Research. So I'm going to start with you. Can you speak a little bit about the incidence of mesothelioma in the UK? Yeah, I'd be glad to, Mary. Um, unfortunately, meso UK, uh, uh, mesothelioma in the UK probably uh, leads the way in terms of incidence. I guess Western Australia mm, is up exactly. there. We're about kind of online with each other. And um, currently in the UK, we have about 2,500 cases of mesothelioma. And... Um, Bear in mind our population size is about 60 million, so I guess that's less than a quarter of the America. You can see that the incidence is really quite high. Um, about 10% of the incidence is in women, and our theoretical incidence of peritoneal mesothelioma should be around about 10% as well. Actually, that's not very well um, established, and what we see in practice is far less than that, which is something that always amazes me when I do come here, mm -hmm. because actually in clinical practice, about 3% of my caseload is peritoneal mesothelioma, and mine's quite typical of the rest of the UK. So, um, you know, a, a real heavy um, caseload of patients in the UK, unfortunately, and it directly correlates to our imports of asbestos in the UK, um, directly correlates. Do you have a year that they're expected the incidence to peak? Has that been predicted as of yet? We have some great epidemiological um, studies going on in the UK, head by Ju led by Julian Pito, um, and um, they've kind of shifted a little bit in when we expect the peak. Originally it was going to be 2020, then it was going to be 2011 to 2015, and um, I'm not so sure that we actually know mm -hmm. our peak in uh, imports of asbestos was through the 70s and if you look at the correlation between the two then you'd expect it to be 30 40 years on from there the sad thing is we're seeing an increase year on year I've been in post looking after just mesothelioma for seven years um, working in thoracic oncology for 11 years and in the seven years I've been in practice we've gone from about 1850 cases a year to 2400 cases right, so a significant year. So, Significant increase year on year, and in, we expect the peak to be within five years. 
The problem is we don't know what's going to happen after that. There's mm -hmm. low, our, our country is riddled with asbestos. Mm -hmm. Our schools, our hospitals. In, in my local town, I've had three professors from my local university. Um, you know, th this is an indiscriminate disease, mm -hmm. and um, so we don't really know about the legacy after um, you know, we've actually been putting the asbestos in. The damage of the asbestos that's left behind is an unknown quantity, really. Mm -hmm. And you just, how about in Canada? Um, what's happening in Canada in terms of number of cases? Um, well, our country is about a tenth the size of the United States. Um, there aren't a huge uh, number of uh, reports about statistics, but from Stats Canada, and the latest I could find was in 2009, um, the incidence has gone up from just under 250 cases 15 years earlier to just close to 500 cases. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely on the rise. Is it a reportable disease in Canada? Um, I don't know that. Yeah, I don't, I don't either, yeah. I don't okay. know that, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. It's in the UK, um, it's notified. Right. Mm -hmm. There might be people here who could answer that. I don't know, Brenda, do you, do you know whether it's reportable? Whether the whether mesothelioma is a reportable disease in Canada? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Steve, how about in Australia? Could you speak a little bit about the number of yeah, cases? I mean, and I think we follow very much the UK. Um, so the we're second to the UK is the highest incidence. I think the US is sort of third on that on the list. Um, we have about um, 700 cases in Australia wide per year. Um, of in Western Australia, where I'm from, more specifically, we have about 75 cases. That's uh, irrelevant because I'll, I'll mention it in a second, but um, we only have a population of about 23, 24 million. So, you know, when we add the figures up, it's quite, quite a high proportion, but just a bit under what the UK've got. As far as the peritoneal, it's about the standard, and that is around the 10 to 15 percent. Mm -hmm. um, some areas you go to will say it's a bit more, some will be a bit less, but generally it's around the 10, 15 percent mm -hmm. mark. Um, the difference, though, that we have in Australia compared to the UK, or more so, is that that we had some active mining of asbestos. And in Western Australia in particular, in Whittenham in the north of the state, we had a very large asbestos mine. And so we see an awful lot of patients in Western Australia in particular. So we've got the highest incidence within Australia, in Western Australia. We're only about 1.5 million people in, in WA, and yet we have you know, a tenth of the, um, of the total number of meso cases. But we're still seeing a lot of patients coming uh, as a, a, a consequence of the mining, either directly, or the families of those people, the kids of those, those people, um, the ones that were working at the mine, they're actually now being exposed. The interesting with the... Inc with, with the you know, when is it going to peak in Australia? You know, very much, I mean, we, we use a lot of statistics from our own um, people as well as those from the UK, etc. Because we, like I said, the use in, in Australia was very similar sort of pattern to the UK. And it was sort of predicted around that 2020 would be the peak. But in fact, we may have actually reached the peak or we're getting pretty close to it if we haven't reached it. So we're on a, a sort of a plateau phase now. We may have a slight increase uh, in the next couple of years, but it looks like it's sort of plateaued out. What we're desperately waiting for is for it to come down, but the feeling is that it won't come down for another 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we may not go up anymore, but we're not going to go down mm -hmm. for quite a while. Now, Luciano, in uh, Italy, I mean, we see a tremendous number of publications for a small country, which leads me to believe that you have a high incidence or just prolific writers. Sorry, What's sorry. happening in Italy in terms of the population of mesothelioma patients? Oh, what happens is that uh, actually what we are uh, experiencing right now is that there's a dramatic increase of incidence of patients with meso. Uh, we have got some, some specific spots uh, where the incidence of meso is really very high because due to environmental, both environmental and uh, occupational exposure. So especially in Northern Italy, we've got a lot of patients with, with, uh, with new, newly diagnosed with mesothelioma. And on the whole, across our country, we've got 1,000 patients with mesothelioma each year, um, approximately. And uh, exactly as I said earlier, uh, more concentrated in some spots, especially close by to Turin, Whereas a big factory of asbestos did work for a bit for a long for a bit while, and uh, caused a massive exposure to uh, people working in that factory. But 
uh, cause a lot of exposure to people living in wet area. So we got a lot of environmental cases, very young people in their um, I saw patients with, I, I'm, I'm seeing patients in early, in, in, in very early 30s uh, because they've been exposed, exposed science, science, since uh, very, very, very childhood, so developing measles right now. Um, uh, that's a problem. Um, the other problem is perspectively, so probably the, the incidence in the next future will be approximately will be the same. Just, Steve just just dis described in the UK as well, it's very similar to what that's going on in, in the UK. There is, there is something, unfortunately, in Italy more that we have got a lot of asbestos anywhere mm -hmm. that has not been removed yet because uh, the banning is not work so so well. We have got unfortunately we've got a lot of uh, millions of tons of uh, of asbestos anywhere, and so there's a big problem in terms of removal of the stuff. Uh, because it's very expensive, must be done in a very safe way, it's not that easy. And so we are not completely quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we don't have any peace of mind regarding the future because the environmental exposure in, 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 our, in our data is still relevant. So that's a problem. Steve, you come from a, you know, such a geographically diverse country. Um, how do you move patients from one end of the country to the other in terms of getting them uh, treatment by a qualified mesothelioma specialist? Um, they don't really. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if <laughs> we are a big country, um, mm -hmm. I think if you, if you, for people who don't know much about the geography, if you take away Alaska and Hawaii, it really Australia fits into the rest of the US. So it's a big country and yet we've got 25 million people. So everyone lives on the outside and it's pretty much desert in the, mid in the middle. So we're centered in a few major cities. So for that reason, if someone has uh, comes forward with mesothelioma in the, the, that particular city, then they'll be treated by someone in that city. There's a pretty good specialist. They'll, they'll see a respiratory physician to start with, um, and then they'll go to a, sometimes surgeons, but to be honest, in Australia, unlike here, we don't do surgery as a routine practice. Um, they'll then uh, see oncologists and go through chemotherapy. Whether they see a specific mesothelioma expert is not uh, always the case. In saying that, the therapy through most of Australia is pretty um, standardised. So, although from centre to centre it will vary a little bit, um, you know, we usually use primetraxad, um, cisplatin as mm -hmm. the standard therapy. Um, and so everyone gets to see a specialist, but not necessarily a meso specialist. Some people will go on clinical trials and jump across the country. Um, of course, that's got to be at their own expense. Mm -hmm. um, although all their um, in-hospital care is all covered by, by um, insur you know, the, the public health system that we mm -hmm. have. And Eunice, how about in Canada? Because I know that you work by provinces. Can right. patients go from one province to another for treatment if they want to see a specialist? Um, and do they need a referral? Okay, so um, Canada is, uh, uh, healthcare is publicly funded uh, in Canada, um, and that essentially means um, that everybody <coughs> is felt to have a right to medical care. Um, having said that, uh, access to mesothelioma experts is somewhat limited. Uh, there's a wonderful new program, relatively new, in Toronto, uh, the Mesothelioma Research Program at Princess Margaret and the um, uh, University Health Network, um, where there's comprehensive care that's delivered. Uh, there are some people throughout the country with expertise. There's an oncologist. Uh, I, I, I don't know every single person, right. but mm -hmm. um, there's some in Vancouver and in um, uh, the maritime provinces, but there are vast areas where there's really no specific expertise. Um, so it, it, in order for somebody to go to a place like um, the program at Princess Margaret, there has to be a referral made by their uh, physician, mm -hmm. and they have to state in that referral or go to the provincial um, um, bureau that uh, stating that there isn't comparable treatment um, that they could receive in their own home province, um, which can stand in the way of their 
going for treatment and it being paid by the province. They can always go if they're willing to pay out of pocket, um, but if they want it uh, to be paid by the government, it has to be uh, with those two provisos. Mm -hmm. And um, Liz, uh, I'd like to go into just a different topic with you. I know that uh, Dr. Mutsayers mentioned about uh, surgery is not performed as often as in Australia, and I know that uh, Great Britain sort of led the way with this Mars trial, and I was wondering if you could just maybe report a little bit on the Mars trial to us, and maybe a little historical development and where we stand now in terms of surgery or how Great Britain is looking at it. United Kingdom. I've got to be correct yeah. on this. <laughs> it's funny how you've not asked me about the distance our patients have to travel, because mm -hmm. <laughs> clearly, clearly they don't, right. um, because we're so such a small country. Um, the Mars study, um, for those of you who don't know, that Mars is an acronym, and it's mesothelioma and um, mesothelioma uh, and radical surgery. I forgot there for a minute. I can't believe that. Mesothelioma and radical surgery. And it was a very small scale, randomized control trial that was testing the methodology mm. as opposed to actually looking at um, the outcomes of the treatment the patients had. Because the two arms of the study were very, very different, in one arm of the study, patients were going to have, um, all of the patients were going to have a cisplatin, a platinum based chemotherapy up front. And then after the platinum based chemotherapy, they were randomized to receive EPP, extra pleuronuminectomy, yes. or not in the other arm. And the or not in the other arm, they could receive other surgical interventions where they were um, appropriate, but they didn't receive EPP. So you can see um, that kind of trial with two extreme arms was going to be very challenging to recruit to. And um, so the study, it was a feasibility study that was set up to test the methodology. And um, it aimed to recruit 50 patients, um, and they were going to be randomized 25-25 into each arm. Those that underwent extra pleuronuminectomy were then going to go on and have whole hemithorax radical radiotherapy afterwards. And um, it took about three years to reach the um, recruitment um, necessary for the trial. And um, the um, paper's not been published yet, but an actual a small abstract's available on the NCRI website in the UK. Um, and um, actu the actual end point was to look at the methodology. And I think that we, we proved that a randomised control trial of that nature in the UK is feasible. I'm not sure it would be feasible in other countries, mm -hmm. but we did demonstrate that a randomised control trial of that nature was feasible. That said, aside from that, um, it also demonstrated that um, those patients that underwent extra pleuronuminectomy, and um, it was um, hoped that 20, well, 25 patients were randomised to that arm, um, but only 16 patients actually um, ended up having extra pleuronuminectomy, and of that 16, only 8 went on to get radical radiotherapy. And um, if you just want to focus on quality of life and survival, the extra pleuronuminectomy arm was less favourable. Um, survival was less favourable. By, by, by about five months mm -hmm. and um, the quality of life was, it was skewed because there wasn't really um, a lot of data provided in the quality of life and immediately after surgery obviously their quality of life was not as good. Right. And probably the numbers were probably too small Very really small. to power not this at this point. Not significant, right. it wasn't powered to demonstrate that mm -hmm. um, but needless to say there's never been a randomised control trial to look at this at all. Right and that's always the, the debate where we have at all these surgical conferences yeah. that Especially in the United States, um, we just wouldn't, patients would not stand to be random, you know, uh, randomized to a trial well, like that. And, 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 and in, in the countries case. where you have maybe a little more faith in the medical system and you have uh, socialized medicine, you may stand a better, uh, a better chance of running a trial like that. We, we demonstrated mm -hmm. that with the MSO1 yeah. study as well, which was this trial that randomized patients to have chemotherapy or not. Mm -hmm. You know, that trial would never have occurred, I don't think, in many other countries, I don't think. The one thing I would say mm -hmm. that was excellent about the Mars study, up until about um, maybe eight years ago, seven years ago, maybe in the UK, we only had 40 thoracic surgeons in the whole of the UK. We now have 70 thoracic surgeons, and I would say about seven years ago, we probably only had a couple of centres that actually put their head above the parapet to actually want to specialise in mesothelioma. Through the Mars study, through a protocol, because people put faith in a protocol and they will sign up to actually um, uh, be involved in a, in a, in a randomised control trial 
trial, a controlled study, we've actually managed to upskill other thoracic surgeons and people are now taking more of an interest and we've developed a pathway within the UK. So, um, you know, there are some um, really positive fallout um, things from, from being involved in a trial of that nature. And they've uh, shown in many of the different uh, clinical trials as well that patients who actually enter clinical trials do better just oh, yeah. because the focus and the care that's given during yeah. a trial. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Moody, in, uh, in Italy, I'm wondering, is there a, is there a lot of uh, transit between the various European countries for patients seeking treatment outside of Italy or outside of France? And do you sort of, uh, you know, trade your patients back and forth, or do you collaborate more in uh, group trials? This is a very good question. Unfortunately, uh, despite the European Union should be an European, should be united. Right. <laughs> Actually, it's not. So, from this point of view, at least. For many of our points of view, unfortunately, but from this point of view as well. So I mean that, uh, at, for, at least as, as, as far as Italy is concerned, uh, our patients would like just to be treated somewhere else across Europe, can be treated for free and paid by, the, by the, our government in case that, that treatment is not available in our country. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, a clinical trial should be, could be free for our patients if no clinical trials are available in Italy, but some clinical trials are available, so it's very difficult. Just to be treated with a conventional treatment or conventional chemotherapy or surgical operation or something more classical, actually, if they want to, do, uh, if they, want to they have to move and to, to pay on their own all the expenses due to the surgical operation and chemotherapy and so on. Uh, I, I, I had, I, I had my own experience, but I, I saw some patients, uh, some Italian patients coming to the UK for, for, for being treated, I had to pay a lot, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very sad from this point of view. Um, uh, unfortunately, clinical trials available across Europe are, <laughs> across Europe are not that so many. <clears throat> no. uh, so these patients sometimes are very, 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 very worried, about, a bit you know, we are not oriented very well. We must, we must be oriented a bit more. Um, but that, that's, the, that's the, the state of the art, unfortunately. So, so if you want to be treated with something else that is not available in our country, you can. And probably you can be paid by our government if, if you can convince them mm -hmm. that there's nothing actually available in our, mm -hmm. nothing similar is available in our country. But it's something normal you have right. to pay for. And unfortunately, there's another Problem is another problem. We have a problem is that uh, our unfortunately our country is, is not that homogeneous in terms of of, of health system, mm -hmm. and the, the south part of Italy unfortunately is not working as we can to do in North, in North Italy, and so most of patients from South Italy are really very very lost mm -hmm. sometimes. So that is very sad. Dr. Matsayers, can you tell us a little bit about how research is funded in Australia? Because I think you have a very different model. Um, I suppose it's in similar in some respects to here in the, in the US. I mean, your main funding body is the NIH, and we have what they call the NHMRC, which is the National Health and Medical Research Council. Um, and it is the major funding body. Um, that's the similarity. That's where it finishes. Mm -hmm. So in the US, you get an awful lot of sponsorship and funding through pharmaceutical companies, et cetera, and private you know, uh, donations. Um, we tend to have 95% of all our major funding comes from the NHMRC. Mm. And when you consider that it's about um, 600 million per year is the total amount, um, it puts a lot of strain on the researchers. Um, at the moment, we're getting about, I think, success rate for NHMRC. This is in the medical research funding. Um, it's about 20% success rate. So one in five grants are successful. Once a year, you can apply and one in five grants is successful, which means that 40, uh, sorry, 80% um, of everyone that applies for a grant does not get funded. Now, uh, I personally sit on some of the granting committees and I know that 80% of the grants that we see should be funded. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we can only fund 20%. So it is quite a difficult situation in Australia. Mm -hmm. There is very, very little money. We, we have um, individual societies, lung foundations, etc., heart foundations, depending on what area. But the sort of money they give, you'd be lucky to get a grant for $50,000 a year, which doesn't pay a full salary. It might pay the consumable expenses. Mm -hmm. So we rely very heavily then on, on, <laughs> on hoping and praying we get NHMIC grants. 
a little bit of external money here and there. Um, a lot of the research centres will do things like clinical trials to raise some extra money, um, the, you know, a bit of soft money that helps us to be able to then put that back into research. Uh, but but it, is, it, is, it is difficult. In saying that, you know, I know the NIH is the main funding body here, and I think that's down to 10% or something like that, 12%. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, pretty difficult here. But you do have alternative funding, uh, and it's the same with the UK. They do have alternative funding other than just the MRC, which is the equivalent. Um, and I think with us only having one application per year, it makes life very, very difficult. And I imagine you can see a lot of labs closing down too then. Yeah. I mean, which is a sad thing when you have people dedicated and focused on mesothelioma. Or, or moving to other places in the world. Right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've been the recipient of few. Um, Dr. Goldberg, could you tell us a little bit about Canada, how you fund research there, if sure. you're aware? Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite similar to the, uh, the United States. Um, and instead of the NIH, we have something called the CIHR, uh, and but it's very similar, um, and there's also uh, other private funding agencies. There's pharmaceutical um, companies that support research, um, but. Mesothelioma is not that well known mm -hmm. in Canada, and uh, it isn't sort of at the forefront of what everybody wants to fund. Um, they're obviously going to give money to a form of cancer that's much more prevalent than mesothelioma, so I know that people do struggle to get money, that uh, we don't have a similar organization in Canada mm -hmm. uh, like MARF, but we luckily can apply for for funding and some people have been successful um, so that's been very helpful as well but there are some clinical trials that are uh, going on and people have been successful in getting some money so uh, there are a number that are ongoing at the um, uh, mesothelioma research program at uh, the UHN so uh, one of them which is quite unique I think um, is a study that's uh, it's done by CT and uh, these are asymptomatic people who have been exposed to asbestos mm -hmm. um, at least 15 years or more uh, ago and um, I think there have been about 1,200 people who have been screened so far and they've detected nine cases of mm -hmm. mesothelioma, five pleural and four peritoneal um, and these are asymptomatic. Right, so I think the interest part of that trial will be you know, do we do a CT scan year one, and when do we repeat that CT scan? How often will these patients need to be scanned to really pick up all the developing mesotheliomas? Yeah. Dr. Moody, could you speak to that a little bit about, you know, anything that, you know, uh, early screening? Is there anything going on in Italy? Screening? Screening, yes. For, you know, say your cement factories and some of those screening workers. Screening is a very debated issue. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some, uh, Italy is split in different regions. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a governor uh, leading any, any, any area. And so the health policy is, uh, is up with this governor. So any governor can decide what you want to do in terms of screening for people, for asbestos exposed people. Uh, some regions are a bit more advanced. For example, they are using uh, Misotelin osteopontin, mm -hmm. uh, this, this new serum proteins, relatively new serum proteins, that are supposed to be able to detect early lesions mm -hmm. or uh, even, even to predict uh, the, the, the onset of the mesothelioma in patients relatively completely healthy at the time. Uh, some, some, in, our, in our area, uh, just the chest is raised then, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so nothing in the end. Mm -hmm. Um, and just uh, just the clinical screening. So are you keeping so is any shortness mm -hmm. of breath or stuff like that? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that um, I think that a, a, a more uh, a more um, a deeper knowledge of how the new protest could be used for screening of this patient could be very useful if we can integrate merge this this protein level assessment with uh, low-intensity CT scan, mm -hmm. 
but as, as a potential tool that uh, some, some of his uh, governor mm -hmm. assumed to be something to be proposed. And uh, the problem is with the, the, what's, the co the, the, what's the population to, to, that should be studied, because right. this, this, is imply, this implies a cost. Mm -hmm. And so it's a big debate about regarding what type of, pay or, of people are actually worth to be studied with such a program or not. So it's still very, still very spotted. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not it's very scattered. There are not so. There's so there's no national effort at this point. Not at all. How about for you, Liz? In yeah, the UK? I, I wanted to pick up on that just because, with regard to screening, I worry that we've globally missed the boat a bit. I think our asbestos-exposed individuals were once concentrated around industrial areas, such as mm -hmm. Wittenoom, and so it was easier to screen. They're far more disparate group now, mm -hmm. and exposure is very casual in so many of the cases that we see. So how do you identify your at-risk population when the exposure is so casual? No. However, that said, um, we run a national helpline at Mesothelium UK, and we get a significant number of calls from what we call the worried well. So mm -hmm. people who have had either heavy or very casual exposure and um, we, we, we adopt a, a variety of approaches with those. I was very lucky that I actually spent some time in Western Australia and I spent some time with um, Greg DeLue and he, he's the GP who runs a clinic um, in the Asbestos um, Disease Association there. And um, I was quite impressed with the, uh, with the screening clinic that he runs. He sees people um, and does an annual chest x-ray, an annual ch examination, and annual spirometry. And I understand they've picked up a number of early um, mesos, but also lung cancer. And you know that asbestos and smoking are synergistic. They work together and it increases your risk of lung cancer significantly. So that, for me, was the only clinical example of any screening program that's currently running and addressing that real fear that people have with heavy exposure. The other side of the coin, the, the majority of people that ring me or ring Meso UK concerned about their exposure, it's been very casual. Mm -hmm. And I try to put that in context, really, mm -hmm. in context of life, you know. Um, as a woman, I'm far more at risk of developing breast cancer. And as a man, you know, prostate cancer and lung cancer if you're a smoker. So I, I think I tr we try to just Temper dampen down. down the flames mm -hmm. and just let's put it in context of life. And let's think about what we can do to positively avoid any cancer, mm -hmm. not just mesothelioma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. we, yes, so, please. OK. No, no, I, I, I agree. Um, I think that actually this screening program should be tested uh, within population with a certain exposure yeah. within within a relatively small area. For example, in Italy, we've got some Wittenoon experience, something like that. Is a, the, the name of the city is, is, is Casale Monferrati, it's close by Turin, and the asbestos factory did, did work in that area for many years. So all the population, the, the, the epidemiological studies showed that all the population is at higher risk to develop a mesothelioma compared to the control in the, the, the closer areas. So that, unfortunately, all this population is very good, uh, I know, model to be studied. Mm -hmm. And I think that this type of study um, to detect any, any tool able to, to, to sorry, to, 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 uh, to assess what's the best tool to, to, to detect early lesion, when any study that could be successful, would be successful, could be transferred to other uh, realities, I know, mm -hmm. other area or something like that. But I think that any screening program, uh, I totally agree, any screening program should be tested within populations who are being, who have been certainly exposed, mm -hmm. with where the incidence of mesothelioma is certainly higher than the normal, mm -hmm. yeah. the other areas. And when successful, we could try to transfer this, this program, if necessary. Well, th this it, program it, at uh, Princess Margaret, that's, that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's with high-risk people. Mm -hmm. And they, they also detected, I think, nine or 10 cases of lung cancer mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So um, before we close, I was wondering if maybe you could all, each one, uh, talk about any new advances or anything that you see on the horizon uh, in terms of uh, treating patients with mesothelioma or giving them better care. Luciano, would you, would sorry, you start? I'm oh, no, sorry, okay. can I get it? For, for, for Steve, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. 
No, it's okay. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, okay, so, I mean, there's a lot of st uh, different trials going on in, in Australia. Um, a lot of them are the sort of um, standard sort of approaches, looking at different chemotherapeutic agents, different combinational approaches. Um, I'll just mention a couple, I mean, that I'm more knowledgeable about that's happening in WA. Not necessarily all of them are directly therapeutic, but they're um, at least uh, a bit more their trials, but to understand the biology more of the disease in the individual, which may help then uh, lead to some more specific uh, treatment. Because I think, as has been mentioned here, every ch person's tumour is different. Mm -hmm. And we, we can't always treat everybody exactly the same way. It's easy enough to say we just give them cisplatin plus whatever. Um, and, and that will work as first-line therapy, but a lot of people will then need some sort of second-line therapy, which will be more specific to that particular tumour. There's a couple of studies. Um, I'm a pure basic scientist, so I'm not involved in directly the clinical trials, although we did do some work which was funded um, here by MARF, um, looking at a particular signaling pathway. It's a developmental pathway mm -hmm. um, that you know embryos require to, to develop, and that's called a hedgehog pathway. We've done preclinical type studies which have identified this as maybe a, a, a very important pathway in mesothelioma. And we're now uh, working with um, uh, uh, a couple of people, one in here in the US and also one in the UK to potentially set up um, clinical trials. So Hetty Kindler presented here last year, he, she talked to you on chemotherapy. And so we're very keen on looking at inhibitors as pathway and seeing what's going on, you know, whether we can treat mesothelioma. So this is a great op opportunity to see something which has gone from the bench straight through to the clinic. Um, one of the other studies which is particularly interesting in WA, and this is not a, a treatment, but it's like I said, trying to understand the biology. So some people here may have heard of PET screening, and this is a, a whole body uh, imaging system. So effectively you get injected with a radioactive dye linked to some molecule, and the standard is a glucose molecule. The idea is that highly metabolically active cells will take up the glucose because it needs it to, to, to work. And that, so what you do is you do a whole body screen, and you can see areas that light up in the patient. And this sort of approach is generally used if someone's got a cancer and they want to look for metastases, for the tumour spreading and gone to different sites, they do a whole body screen. So this is great, but we can also do a lot more with this. And so there's some trials going on uh, within our, our institute. And what they're doing is they're linking this radioactive molecule to other molecules. For example, um, you can link it to a thymidine. Thymidine is, is a molecule which is required for cells to divide. So not only can we look at metabolically active cells, the problem with that, of course, is other metabolically active tissues, like the liver and the bone marrow, are going to glow all the time. You're not going to be able to see metastases in those areas because they're metabolically active anyway. But if we have this label that goes into cells which are dividing more rapidly, we can then identify those areas where you've got very active tumours. And so this is interesting because we've associated that you know, the more active the tumour is, the more proliferation that's happening, then the worse prognosis. So we get a better idea of prognosis in the patients than just taking a sample from one bit of tumour, which doesn't always reflect the whole tumour or potential other metastases. And the other thing is that this system can be used, and it's currently being used, to link to other specific molecules. Um, we can understand more about the, which cells are dying in particular ways, a, method, a, a mechanism called apoptosis, by linking this radioactive molecule to different molecules which mark apoptosis. And so we can a understand more about the biology of what's happening in the human. And up to now, really, we've done a lot of in vitro studies, that is work in tissue culture plates, and we've done a lot of work in animal models. But we really need to do and understand more what's happening at the time in the humans, and I think this is giving us a great opportunity to visualise what's going on. CTs are just very static images, whereas with, with the PET analysis, we can actually see an ongoing um, changes in, in these patients. And I think that's really, really quite yeah, exciting. Yeah, I think they've looked at some PET scans now in relation to surgery and mm -hmm. SUVs over 10 have a poor outcome. So sure. we're starting to sort of quantify maybe what patients should go to surgery yep, uh, based on the results of the PET scans. Yeah. Liz, is anything particularly exciting in the UK at this point? Um, I would, there's a few things. I'd, mm -hmm. I mean, I'd pick up on that and uh, in that, um, you know, there's a, there's a real air of optimism mm -hmm. at the minute currently. I think internationally on a scientific mm -hmm. level, there's an air of optimism that I haven't seen before mm -hmm. and that I think that we have seen individualized, biologically tailored treatments develop 
up in other tumour sites and um, it, it's our turn now. So I think mm. there's a lot of optimism about that we're not that far off individualised treatment, targeted treatments. I think we're maybe not far away from having um, approved second line treatments. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's one step away. Um, in the UK, we're waiting to hear if a study's been funded to look at, in a much larger study, to look at the role of prophylactic irradiation to wounds, mm -hmm. because there's lots of debate about whether, yeah. whether or not we should be treating um, small wounds, large wounds, how much should we be treating them, does it actually prevent seeding of, of mesothelium into the tracts. So we've got that study that should answer that question once and for all, but I'm an optimist, I'm a glass half full person. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, through organisations like MARF and Meso UK and asbestos support groups globally, I think I'm excited that I think we're mm -hmm. beginning to get awareness up there on the agenda of people who can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And maybe um, starting to get more pressure put on countries to um, look at their asbestos agendas and, and banning mm -hmm. um, asbestos. Um, Whole hemithorax um, radiotherapy um, with the lung intact. There's been some whisperings of centres mm -hmm. that are developing expertise in that area. That's exciting. You know, I think there's a lot more of that to come. So, um, I, you know, I, I, th there are lots of things that I'm quite um, optimistic about. I think Malcolm about. Feigen from actually from Australia yeah, was really champion the IMRT. Yeah. Uh, We've uh, got Mars job. 2 mm -hmm. on the horizon yeah. and mm -hmm. um, uh, MSO2, we're probably looking at standard treatment plus or minus varinostat, I think. Mm -hmm. can, know, I, so. can I just add, I think, I mean, Liz is right about this air optimism at the moment. Mm. Optimism that we are finally maybe going to find something that's maybe not cure but at least help the patients but I think a lot of this is because through organizations like MARF, IMIG etc there's a number of them um, specifically MISO and sometimes a little bit more broader there's a lot more international national and international collaborations going on now mm -hmm. so um, you know it, it's it's meetings like this where, where people get drawn together from within the country or between different countries and then we can start talking together about what we can do as a whole as was mentioned before you know mesothelioma despite the fact everyone has been you know many of you here have been hit by it one way or another it is still a relatively rare disease some places worse than others of course not so rare but it's very hard to do a lot of trials when you don't see that many patients or that many patients that don't fit the criteria for that trial. Mm -hmm. So the only way we can really look at it properly is by going multi-centre, and that could be multi-centre within your own country or ideally multi-centre internationally. And I think this is really starting to build up. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll see more websites, MARF websites is really good. Um, the IMIG one is Wrong building up. I think we're, we're going to see this bigger interaction between groups around the world, which is really going to make a, a real impact on, on where we go with treatment, uh, biology and treatment. Mm. So for the patients in the room, I think what the message is, is protect your health, eat well, exercise well, things are on the horizon and we're going to work together and we're going to come up with something. Dr. Moody, would you like Sorry. to say something in conclusion? No, I don't want to make, no, 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 no. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, I'd like just to give you some, just, just a, 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 there is a relatively novelty that has been to be published in the next few weeks, suppose, on JCO. Uh, so, as you probably know, most of the guidelines, at least the European ones, say that, um, say, say that uh, chemotherapy should be used on a patient-based criteria uh, according to the, 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 the performance status, the patient's performance status and so on. Um, that's what we've been, do we been doing over the last few years, since we, at least these guidelines have been published. And the, the novelty is that this meta-analysis showed that actually uh, if, if he is a, is a me for mesothelioma, epithelial mesothelioma, any type of treatment, any chemo, uh, can improve uh, people who have got a, a partial response or a, 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 a stable disease at least have got a gain of survival of a mm -hmm. few months. Mm -hmm. um, so this means that probably for in the next future for our patient with epithelial mesothelioma, chemotherapy should not be just a choice but something more mandatory. Mm -hmm. You say in English, mandatory or mandatory? Sometimes it's a bit... Depends whether you're north or south. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, it, something is, 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 is changing. Um, the other thing is that, as Steve said, uh, we have got many new biomolecular 
uh, marker mm -hmm. that can be ad uh, targeted with new treatments. And this research is, is going very fast compared to some years ago, at least, because now, fortunately, the financial support is a bit more reasonable than earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that new clinical trial, new, new, new phase two, for example, that are absolutely needed, desperately needed, are, are going to be, to be available in the next future. And something new in terms of frontline therapy as well in first line. Uh, a final remark would be mm -hmm. that one of the problems we have to deal with, at least in Italy, but I think across Europe as well, is the pharmaceutical companies are not that keen to support clinical trials, phase three, expensive phase three clinical trials, for example, for mesothelioma, because it's still a, a relatively rare tumor. Mm -hmm. And I think from this point of view, I think that the voice from the patients and the voice from the organization, research organization, and our voices as well, why not, uh, is, is absolutely uh, needed to convince pharmaceutical, convince pharmaceutical companies to invest more money for this tumor. Uh, also in light of the fact that, for example, mesothelioma in Far East is going up so, so rapidly, and so it's soaring in terms of a, a, a incidence. So also from, I'm sorry, but from an economical point of view, from a lucrative point of view, I'm sorry to say these things, but no, but it's a, it's a, it's a logical, it's a market logic. Uh, and so it's not that, it's, it's, it's a big deal from a certain point of view. So we, but I think that the voice, the voice from ourselves, the voice from the organization, the, 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 voice from, the, the, the voices from patients especially, is crucial just to help us to go ahead and just to, for example, to, we, we have got some results that cannot be translated into clinical trials because pharmaceutical companies are not interested in. Mm -hmm. It's a big waste of time. Uh, maybe is, is a waste of exploring some chance to treat patients more, more, more efficiently. Just to add to that though, just because uh, I, as I said, I'm a, an optimist that we are less dependent on tumor specific studies now because we are biologically targeting our treatments based on what switches a tumor on and switches it off and those issues are similar across all tumors and so you know, that's the flip side of that. Is the good thing is, you yeah. know, I just right. wanted to, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, we could look at ERCC1 and yes. we could look yes, at too. TS levels yes. and predict response. I think response. it was Dr. Torb who was saying that mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. you know, the, other, the other thing, too, is that I know a number of groups, when they want to look at mesothelioma, they do a lung cancer study and they have mesothelioma as controls. <laughs> so that's the way of actually getting the companies to actually support it, because they think mm -hmm. they're supporting uh, a, a, a a control. lung cancer <laughs> study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, look, you do whatever you can. Mm -hmm. um, and can so, you know, they had a bit of success that way of getting some trials funded that way, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I just add yes, that I, I still feel that, at least in a country like Canada, there is still a need for a great deal of education, mm -hmm. uh, both uh, in the, for the general public and also amongst healthcare providers, um, that there are some who still are reluctant to, you know, to do anything, mm -hmm. and as soon as they make a diagnosis of mesothelioma, it's like, go home and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, make plans, and, uh, and, and, and they we, have we a very pessimistic outlook, mm -hmm. and there are people who don't know where to turn or what to do, so mm -hmm. organizations like Mm -hmm. uh, MARF and hopefully our foundation and other ones around the world mm -hmm. will help um, spread the word and help educate. Yeah, I think what, uh, one, one problem that I see though is, you know, we all have developing our websites and we all have very credible information, but, you know, with the advent of Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, what's happening is that we're having some rather strong voices who are not medical, who are sort of skewing patients in the wrong direction rather than leaving them to credible websites or credible treatments. And, you know, uh, we've all had clinical trials where, you know, you've had 10 patients and one patient has had this absolutely incredible response to a drug. No one else on that trial did well. And that voice sometimes needs to be tempered so there's not this, you know, over optimism to send people to something that's not, that has proven itself not to work. Like we, you know, we had the, uh, you know, the um, a doctor from the NCI today talking about some of the alternative and, you know, complementary care medicines. And my, my thing has always been that if a patient is going to seek alternative or complementary care, wherever they're seeking that should be held to the same level as a phase one trial. 
where that send, that, that they have to do scans before and after, they have to have medical oversight, and their records have to be open for scrutiny. Otherwise, they're beyond belief, they're not credible, and patients should not be throwing their money away because in reality, it really is to the detriment of everyone in this room that patients who are not going on a clinical trial and instead are seeking treatments that they're, they're wasting their time, they're wasting their resources, and they're depriving us of the knowledge that we need to advance this disease forward. So um, I think we're going to conclude now because we are reaching the end of the presentation. What, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to bring to these speakers? Can I just say a point about education, yes. just mm -hmm. very quick. Um, we, um, through the Royal Marsden Hospital in, in London, we run a totally, just to pick up on your point about education, we run a totally online mm -hmm. um, 15 credit masters or um, graduate level course in mesothelioma and we've had it's mostly nurses that have done the course we've run it twice now we've had three or four nurses from australia we've had a nurse from south africa and we've got a nurse from japan about to enroll for the next one so there are the there is a you know an, a purely online international accredited course um, in mesothelioma available it's the only one in the world that i'm aware of it isn't that expensive it, it, through the Royal Marsden School of Nursing and Rehabilitation. So look at, and it's called Mesothelioma Care in Practice. And so tell your healthcare professionals about it because it's, you know, we have a doctor from New Zealand who, who lectures on it and, you know, we have got international people. We have patients and carers who come on and blog with the, with the students. Um. Which is great because it also gives that personal experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank all the speakers for, uh, for well, their, their great participation and sharing their knowledge of their countries and of the disease and also the concerted efforts on behalf of everyone here to collaborate and to really try to advance the, uh, the treatment of this disease and to fight for that cure. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>